difficultly at times, uh, but you'll see there are five oracles. They're not evenly divided. A couple oracles are only, one oracle is only two, two verses. Another is only five verses. Others are a whole chapter. But there are five of them, and they're, they're going to be the five points of the sermon this morning. So hear this, this oracle, uh, and you can use your outline. There's an outline in your bulletin as uh, I preach as well. Well, hear the word of the Lord, and this is the word of the Lord. An oracle concerning the desert by the sea, like whirlwinds sweeping through the southland. An invader comes from the desert, from a land of terror. A dire vision has been shown to me. The traitor betrays, the looter takes loot. Elam attack, media lay siege. I will bring to an end all the groaning she has caused. At this, my body is racked with pain. Pain, Pangs seize me like those of a woman in labor. I am staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. My heart falters. Fear makes me tremble. The twilight I long for has become a horror to me. They set the tables. They spread the rugs. They eat and they drink. Get up, you soldiers. Oil the shields. This is what the Lord says to me. Go. Post an outlook and give him report of what he sees. And what he sees when he sees chariots with teams of horses, riders on donkeys or riders on camels, let him be alert, fully alert. And the lookout shouted, Day after day, my Lord, I stand on the watchtower. Every night I stay at my post. Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses. And he gives back the answer. Babylon has fallen has fallen. All the images of its gods lie sh- shattered on the ground. Oh, my people, crushed on the threshing floor, I tell you what I've heard from the Lord Almighty, from the God of Israel. An oracle concerning Duma, someone calls to me from Seir, Watchman, what is left of the night? Watchman, what is left of the night? The watchman replies, morning is coming, but also the night. If you would ask, then ask, and come back yet again. An oracle concerning Arabia. You caravans of the Didanats who camp in the thickets of Arabia, bring water for the thirsty. You who live in Tema, bring food for the refugees. They flee from the sword from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, from the heat of battle. This is what the Lord says. Within one year, a servant, as a servant bound by contract would count it, all the pomp of Kedar will come to an end. The survivors of the bowmen, the warriors of Kedar will be few. The Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. An oracle concerning the valley of vision. What troubles you now that you have all gone up on the housetops? O town full of commotion, O city of tumult and revelry, revelry. your slain were not killed by the sword, nor did they lie in battle. All your leaders have fled together. They have been captured without using the bow. All you who were caught were taken prisoner together, having fled while the enemy me was still far away. Therefore I said, turn away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to console me over the destruction of my people. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the valley of vision, a day of battering down walls and of crying out to the mountains. Elam takes up the quiver and with her chariots and horses, Kerr uncovers the shield Your choicest valleys are full of chariots. The horsemen are posted at the city gates. The defenses of Judah are stripped away. And you looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw the city of David had many breaches in its defenses. You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. 
but you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. The Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and pull, put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. The Lord Almighty has revealed this in my hearing. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord, the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord, the Almighty says. Go, say to this steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the palace, what are you doing here? And who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here, hewing your grave on the height and chiseling your resting place in the rock? Beware the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, O oh, you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a large country. There you will die and there your splendor chariots will remain. You disgrace to your father's house. I will dispose you from your office, depose you from your hot office, and you will be ousted from your position. In that day, I will summon my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a seat of honor for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him, its offspring and offshoots, all its lesser vessels, from the bowls to all the jars. And that day declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall. And the, and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. An oracle concerning Tyre. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed and left without house or harbor. From the land of Cyprus, word has come to them. Be silent, you people of the island, and you merchants of Sidon, whom the seafarers have enriched. On the great waters came the grain of the Shephor. The harvest of the Nile was the revenue of Tyre, and she became the marketplace of the nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon, and you, O fortress of the sea, for the sea has spoken. I have neither been in labor nor given birth, I have neither reared sons nor brought up daughters. When word comes to Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report from Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, wail you people of the island. Is this your city of revelry, the old, old city, whose feet have taken her to settle in far off lands? Who planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns and the mer whose merchants are princes whose traitors are renowned in the earth. The Lord Almighty planned it to bring low the pride of all glory and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. Go through your land. The daughter of Tarshish, like the Nile, will no longer be a haven for you. The Lord has stretched out his hand over the sea and made his, its kingdoms tremble. He has driven an order concerning Phoenicia that her fortresses be destroyed. He said, no more of your revel, O virgin daughter of Sidon, now crushed. Up across over to Cyprus, even there you will find no rest. Look at the land of the Babylonians, this people that is now of no account. The Assyrians have made it a place for desert creatures. They've raised up their siege towers and they've stripped its fortresses bare and turned it to a ruin. Wail, you ships of Tarshish, your fortress is destroyed. 
At that time, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. But at the end of these 70 years, it will happen to Tyre, as in the song of the prostitute. Take up a harp, walk through the city, O prostitute forgotten. Play the harp well, sing many a song, so that you will be remembered. At the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her hire as a prostitute and will ply her trade with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Yet, her profit and her earnings will be set apart for the Lord. They will not be stored up or hoarded. Her profits will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you help us in these five oracles. Lord, we get to the bottom of them. We'll see what really is going on in these. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us patience in your word. Give us a sight of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask in his name. Amen. One of the most fundamental questions of life is, whose world is this? Is it our world or is it God's world? And how we answer that question is, says so much about us. It tells us really who we are. If this world is our world, we can form it, we can fashion it, we can make it as we want it to be. Of course, with many limitations. But if this world is God's world, then God has made it. God is forming it. God is directing it according to his own purposes. Completely two different worldviews I've presented before you and are here today. C.S. Lewis said, no doubt all history is the last resort, and the last resort must be held by Christians to be a story with a divine plot. History, a story with a divine plot. He said in another place, history is a story written by the finger of God. Or as it's been popularly known as, history is his story. He has written it. And these chapters and these oracles before us are making this very point clearly. God is sovereign over all the nations, over all of history. He is speaking and it's happening. He is deciding. He is planning. The God is the God of all times and of places and peoples. Yahweh is no local deity that's bound to the, the borders of Israel. But he is the Lord of all the earth. This is his world. As John Calvin said, the world is God's theater where he is playing out his will, his plot. He said that, 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 uh, that it's being directed by the ever-present hand of God. It's in the Lord's hands. The nations serve the Lord's purposes. And we see this over and over again in these oracles, don't we? And I want you to look at them. As we see uh, the, the first one, Babylon, just in the first 10 verses. And, and you might notice right from the beginning, it doesn't say Babylon, does it? It says uh, the desert by the sea. Sounds like a nice resort, sandals or um, club med or something like that. The desert by the sea. But it is Babylon. Look at verse 9. Babylon is fallen. That's what it's talking about. Babylon is the, the city that's invaded and attacked and besieged in these verses. But you might, if you know geography, say... Well, Babylon is not by the sea. Babylon is hundreds of miles from the Persian Gulf. Hundreds of miles from the sea. It's on a river, yes, the Euphrates, but it's not on a sea. Why, why is Babylon being called the desert? The, the, the desert resort, that's the desert by the sea. Well, in, I found out this week that, that uh, ancient Near Eastern people could talk about bodies of water as the sea, so they could be referring to the Euphrates River. Uh, there also is quite a bit of marshland, I understand, at least in the times uh, of Isaiah between the two rivers of Euphrates and Tyrus. And between there, there's water. And, they, and Syria at one point calls it the sea land in one of their documents. So it, people thought of things that way. But I think it's even more than that. I think it's literary here. A sea and a desert, think about it. They're both very opposite. One is wet and one is dry. 
but they're very much the same. They are both wastelands. They are both wastelands without, without water. Neither of them can give you life. Without water in them, you will die on a desert or a sea. Uh, Ray Orton Jr. did a great job in his commentary, and he had said it this way. He says, when, when he calls Babylon the desert of the sea, he's being sarcastic. A desert can't sustain human life. And the sea, as Coolidge put it, is water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. The desert of the sea is the worst possible scenario. It's both dry and wet together, but neither condition is conducive for human life. In other words, Babylon has nothing to offer us. That's really what's being said here. It is a, a city that God is bringing down. Look at verse 2. It, the eye is the, there. The first person is God. God is, is, is bringing it down. And, but before he brings it down, there's much pain. Notice the emphasis in this oracle on pain and suffering. And Isaiah feels the pain in verse 3 and 4. The pain that Babylon brings upon God's people, which is the threshing. Look at verse 10. It ends with this. The threshing floor is there. That God's people are being pounded. God's people are being beaten. But unlike chaff that blows away, they are grain that's being beaten for a purpose beaten on the threshing floor by Babylon, but not destroyed. And either Isaiah hires a watchman, or I, I think it really should be translated that Isaiah is the watchman in verses 6 through 9 uh, of chapter 21, that he will see this day come when Babylon goes down. Now, people debate about when this is. It, it, it doesn't really matter, but I, I think it's the 539 date where Babylon was overcome by uh, the uh, Persian, Medan, Persian Empire. And we're told that it happened just like verse 5 says. Verse 5 says people were laying out rugs and they're going about their, their, their feast day, and yet they should be getting up and oiling the, the shields. They should be getting ready for battle. They weren't. And when the Persians took Babylon, they took it without much fight. People were in one part of the city, didn't even know that the city was falling. It happened that quickly. And it's exactly what happens in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, if you know that. That it's the, the Daniel has the, the hand, handwriting on the wall, Belshazzar is the Babylon king. And he sees and the proverbial handwriting on the wall and sees that his nation is falling. That very night he dies and the nation comes over. It happens quickly. People are setting out tables and spreading rugs and eating and drinking. And it all happens. Babylon falls just like the Lord says it would. What's the point? The point is that don't trust in Babylon. Last week it was don't trust in Egypt. Now it's don't trust in Babylon, but trust the Lord. Even though he slay you, even though he allows pain in your life, even though he brings you on the threshing floor, he is speaking, he is acting, he is working, but the world in Babylon is a wasteland. Your God has the nations in his hand. And he has a plan for you. This same God is saving his people, justifying and sanctifying his people all through history. Oh, that's the first point. Second point, two verses only in 21, 11, and 12. Uh, again, it doesn't say Edom there, does it? But it says Duma, which means silence. And it sounds like Edom a bit. But we know that it's Edom because it mentions Seir, which is in Edom. And they are calling here, they're calling to the watchman. Probably connected with the oracle before. They're calling to the prophet. They're calling to Isaiah. Uh, what is left of the night? How long will the night last? Is what they're saying. The Chicago song. Does anyone know what time it is? Is whether what they're asking here. And they press the point twice. And the answer is morning is coming, but then it will be night again. You, you're just going to have to keep asking and asking and asking. And you say, well, that's kind of cryptic. What is that really saying? Well, Be Edom is probably waiting for news about Babylon because it will affect their lives as well. But there's really no really definitive word overall for them. They're in the dark. It's silence them. 
And how true this is throughout history, how the world doesn't get it. The world doesn't understand that this world belongs to the Lord. And the world goes through and doesn't know the end of history. They don't know how it's all going to end. We don't know the specifics, but we know a lot. We know that our God will overcome. We know that we'll sit in Zion uh, worshiping him and the feast that, that is coming. But the world doesn't know this. They're in the dark about the flow of history and what it all means. They're in the dark about future. It's all just a cycle of nights and days for them. It's all just a, a series of unanswered questions. But God's people have the word from the Lord. We know where history is headed. There is a God that we know loves us even in the middle of the night when we are in suffering. We don't have all the answers, no. Not even close, but we have the key ones. We know where history is going. What we have is true, and that's enough for now. It will see us through the night until that final day comes that the Lord has planned. Oh, that's the second oracle. You ready for the third one? Third one, only five verses. Arabia mentioned there. All, all three of these are in chapter 21. You got to know that Qadar is a brand name for Arabia. So it's just the same thing. So you got to know that. You might not have known it. And, and Arabia is that giant area, that huge area, Saudi Arabia now, south of Israel. And these towns that are mentioned, these names that are mentioned, are, are, are towns in the hills of the northwest part of Arabia. And what's happening here? Uh, these towns are receiving fugitives. They're, they're welcoming people who are fleeing from battle. They're fleeing something. But we know it's connected with pride. Look at verse 16. Because their pride and their pomp is going to be brought down. How do you put that together? Who are these people fleeing from? We're not told. It doesn't tell us. Assyria invaded Arabia many different times. It could be any of those times. Those were all in Isaiah's day. But it really doesn't matter. It's, a, it's, it's another judgment that Yahweh is bringing. And the point is, in the wider context, why are they running to these towns? In the wider context of what we've been seeing, of how God is drawing people to Zion and the nations will come to Zion, I, I can't not believe that that's what's going on. That Arabia is not coming to the Lord. They're not fleeing in their moment of need to the Lord. They're going to their own people. They're going to what's safe. They're going away from the Lord. Their pride won't let them come to the Lord. We find this in the book of Revelation in chapter 9 when you find one of the worst plagues when the, uh, as, as these, these uh, 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 different uh, plag plagues are coming down uh, upon them. The trumpets are sounding. And it says that the rest of mankind, verse 20 of 9, 920, the rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, and idols of gold, silver, and bronze, and stone, and wood. Idols that cannot see and hear or walk. You see, that's the course of history. People get under duress, but it doesn't drive them to the Lord. And that's what's happening here. Actually, the word Arabia is three consonants in Hebrew. And if you take those three consonants and put different vowels to them, the word can mean night. And that theme of night is coming into this third oracle as well. They, uh, uh, like Edom, are in the dark. They won't come to the Lord for help. They won't go to Zion and find the help that they need. What a commentary on the history of mankind. The world is running the wrong way throughout history. All right, thirdly, we have a couple chapters yet to go. This is the ninth oracle. It's about Jerusalem. And again, it doesn't say Jerusalem right up front, does it? It says it's about what? The Valley of Vision. Uh, but we know it's about Jerusalem. Look at verse 9. It's the city of David. We look at verse 10. The, the buildings there are in Jerusalem. But what is the Valley of Vision? What does that mean? I believe it's an oxymoron. They see a lot 
but you don't see enough because they're in a valley. When, you're in a, when you want to go see the landscape, you don't go in a valley. You go where? To a hilltop. You go so you can see out and see what's happening. You don't go into a valley. You see, Jerusalem is also in the dark. Jerusalem also is like the other nations. Jerusalem is, is, is lost and has lost their sight of the Lord. They're in the lowlands. They're in the valleys of unfaithfulness. Barry Webb put it this way, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, is in reality a valley where no real vision exists. You know, the, they are, Jerusalem's on a, a mountain, so it's not in the valley, so it's not the valleys. But how can Jerusalem be a valley? They're in the valley spiritually of vision. And he goes on to say, the people of Jerusalem are blind to the Lord's purposes. Isaiah sees them clearly and weeps. So what are they blind to? Look at verse 1. Jerusalem is under attack. They're under siege. I believe this is, and there's, again, scholars debate, but I, I've come to the conclusion that I think it's that E.J. Young from Westminster Seminary is right when he says it's, it's 586. It's the time when, when Nebuchadnezzar came, the Babylonian came, and, and drew, brought down Jerusalem with a siege. So they're on their housetops. They're looking out in Jerusalem and they can see that the land around them, Judah around them is falling apart. The enemy is destroying the countryside. Judah is being captured. Leaders are fleeing. We find that and scripturally all these things are, I, I won't take time, but they're Lamentations and Jeremiah and First Kings, uh, 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 Second Kings rather, deals and tells us about uh, these very things that are happening to Jerusalem at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's siege. Soon the walls are going to come tumbling down, verse 5, which is the only time they did come down uh, in, in, in this time period. And, and Elam is uh, that area near Babylon that are coming along probably is, is uh, helping. And, and the Medes and the Elams were there helping the, the Babylonians. And there's no escape. Look at verse 7. They have their chariots in the valley so nobody can get away. They have their men at the gates so no one can get out. And where did God's people go when they were under all this duress, this siege? Where did they turn? Look at verse 8. Look at eight, verse 22, 8. They went to the palace of the forest, which we are told in 1 Kings 7 uh, that Solomon built. It was an armory of weapons. They went to their weapons. Secondly, look at verse 9. They, they went to fortify Jerusalem. They tore down certain structures within Jerusalem to fortify the walls. So you have weapons, as Mortier beautifully put out, and then you have walls. And then the third place they looked to what? They went to make sure they had enough water. Weapons, walls, water. You know, it was always a little tricky in Jerusalem because Jerusalem's a city, but it's not built on a river. It's not built where there's a, there's a stream flowing through it. This, 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 the, the Gihon Spring that feeds the water supply of Jerusalem is outside the city walls. And so they always were dealing with this. And you can go today and go through Hezekiah's tunnel because he built this, this tunnel that you can walk. I walked through it. It's amazing. They chiseled through the rock and brought the water in from outside the walls of Jerusalem, inside so the water supply could be there. You can see it yet today. They looked after the preparations for a siege. But they didn't look to the one who made Jerusalem. Maybe referring to make water, but I think it's probably referring to God had planted this place, this city. It was his city. He chose the location. And could it be that he chose the location so his people would trust him for water? So they wouldn't be going after these things, but they would be saying, Lord, we need you to save us, not ourselves to save us. But they didn't do that. He called them to repentance and they wouldn't come. Verse 12, they, they didn't come to the Lord and repent. Instead, what did they do? They had a big party instead. They acted more like pagans. They drank, they drank and they ate. They basically were giving up. We're giving up. They couldn't see that God could save them. They lived like pagans, like the real pagans that they were at that time, that generation. And therefore their sin, verse 14, cannot be atoned for. 
It's they've committed the unforgivable sin. What's the unforgivable sin? Self-salvation. That's the unforgivable sin. When you think you're so self-sufficient that you can save yourself, when you believe that you can save yourself from the enemy of whatever the enemy is, you've committed a sin. If you persist in it, it will never be forgiven. And this generation of God's people were just like the nations that surrounded them. They were in the dark. They're under God's judgment. They're trusting in themselves. They're in the valley of vision. They can't see a thing. And you know, as we apply this to ourselves, there is something about believing that you are part of God's people, believing that you're part of Christ's church, that you're part of the new Israel, that can make you proud and make us blind and make us self-sufficient. To make us feel that we really don't need grace anymore. We've had enough grace. We can move past it now. I'm fine. I'm fine. I can take it from here, Lord. This is what this generation in Jerusalem believed. Think about faith. Faith is something we have to trust the Lord from first to last. Grace is from first to last. What's faith? It's not a work we do. Faith is simply saying, I trust you, Jesus. Faith is simply saying, Christ save me, saves me, and, and Christ alone saves me. Faith is, is collapsing upon Christ. Faith is falling into his hands, into his arms, and never feeling the need to go anywhere else. And that's what God's people do. Don't let what happened to Jerusalem happen to you, Christian. To think that you can kind of move past the gospel. You can kind of move past grace. You can kind of move past resting in Christ for everything. Your salvation and everything in your life. Well, briefly as I know this sermon is going on and on. But verses 15 through 25, you see an example of this. This Sheb, Shebna is being contrasted from this guy by the name of Eliakim. And Shebna is the, the height of self-sufficiency. He's the, in the king's palace. He was a man, we, you can look at chapter 36 of Isaiah, he was a, man, a real man that lived. <laughs> and he was full of himself in the days of Hezekiah, in the days of Isaiah as well. And he was here cutting a rock for himself, making a, a, a tomb for himself. So everybody would remember him after he died. That was a big deal to him. When it, God's people were facing what they're facing, when they weren't trusting him. And so the question comes out, what are you doing here? What are you doing here at this grave when God's people are in need there? He's the height of pride. And so the Lord says he's going to remove him. And in this place, he's going to put this Eliakim, who's also mentioned in chapter 36 of Isaiah. The, the contrast couldn't be greater. Shebna was self-regarding about his tomb and his chariots. Eliakim was a servant of the Lord, a father of the people. Uh, Shebna, as, as Barry Webb, I'm just reading a little chart that he gave in his commentary. It's really wonderful. It's rolled up like a ball. But Eliakim is peg in a firm place. One is a ball that can be just thrown around. One's a peg that's in a firm place. One is disgraceful. One is honorable. One is deposed by the Lord. One is fixed in a firm place. But then it switches again and we get this, we keep getting these twists in Isaiah's prophecy. But even Eliakim won't last forever. Did you see that in verse 25? The peg will give way. It will even be sheared off implying the Lord will take it away. Why? Why? Because we're shown once again that we cannot trust in any human being. You can't trust, they couldn't trust in Eliakim. We can't trust in any human being except for Jesus. The Jesus that doesn't give way. 
the peg that's driven into a, a hard place and stays there for eternity. The Jesus who is the, the true descendant of David. The, the, the Jesus who uh, will truly rule and does truly rule and holds the keys of death and Hades and, and, and shuts and it stays shut and opens and it stays open just like Revelation 7, or 3, 7 says. What Jesus opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. This is the Savior you want to put your, your faith in. Jesus, Jesus is the only one that won't give way in life. Jesus is the only one that will never break. And we give you the glory of, of being in God's house and God's kingdom forever. You can't save yourself. Only Christ can save you. Now shortly, give him the, hold in there. You got to get this last one. Tyre in verse 23. Again, I'll summarize. Basically, he's telling you, Tyre is destroyed. And Tyre, what was Tyre? Finally, we have one that we know is Tyre. We don't have to figure out which one it's talking about. Tyre is this island that was just off the coast there north of Israel in Syria uh, today, I believe who was worldwide shipping industry. They were the march, look at verse three, they had the marketplace of the nations. That summarizes all that's being said there. From Tarshish all the way in Spain, we believe that is. The Shehor was just part of Egypt. This is an old city. City went back to 2700 BC. It was a city that many, many nations tried to, to take a siege. Nebuchadnezzar sieged it for 13 years and couldn't break it. Finally, it's Alexander the Great that brings down Tyre eventually. But it's not talking about that here. It's talking about 70 years. And the Assyrians did kind of own Tyre for 70, from about 700 BC to 730 BC in that period of time. But that, that's not what's being emphasized. What's being emphasized is who's responsible for this. Verse 9, the Lord did it. The Lord humbles the proud. Or verse 11, he stretched out his hand over the nations and stop the city from its commerce. It's just a mere reach is the idea, is all that is necessary for the Lord to bring the nations to tremble. He doesn't even have to get up. He just has to reach his arm out. He's directing history. Again, we come back to this theme of the sovereignty of God. He ordains whatsoever comes to pass. And we need to remember that on Tuesday, don't we? We need to remember that every day. But there's more as we close here. Tyre makes a comeback. It goes back into business. Like a prostitute that's been gone for a while, now walking through the streets, making a bunch of noise and singing and, and bringing her customers in. So Tyre will, will, will come back and walk the streets of Tyre once more and will sell herself as a city to anybody the highest bidder business yet something's different this time look at verse 18 Tyre's prophets won't go into Tyre's pockets her prophets will be sanctified her prophets will be set apart her prophets will be holy to the Lord in fact it's a Hebrew word used for the high priest turban is used here for Tyre and her prophets will pay the bills of God's people. Now that's weird. That's really weird. Especially when Deuteronomy 23, 18 says that if you make money as a prostitute, you can't give it to the Lord because he detests that. What is God doing here? Is he, is he breaking his own law? No. This verse, verse 18, it's subtle. It's really subtle, but it's there. It implies a major change, a major change in Tyre. Tyre's prophets are no longer dirty money. Tyre's prophets are no longer immorally made. Tyre is now a new city with a new heart. And part of the nations that we've been seeing in the wider context here that are coming to the Lord, Tyre will be there too. Psalm 87, 4 says, I, Lord, I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Philistia, too, and Tyre. You see, 
what's being said here is this, this, this subtle, but it's the same thing that's been said back in chapter 18 and really throughout all of Isaiah, that, that God's people are going to be able to receive from the nations. Isaiah 61, 6 says, You, Israel, will feed on the wealth of the nations, and their riches you will boast. Or Psalm, uh, Isaiah 60, verse 5, uh, Then you will look and be radiant. You, your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas, that's what Tyre got, the wealth from the seas. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you, to your riches of the nations will come. And what do we find in the last chapter or second to last chapter of the Bible when the new Jerusalem is being formed? It's there in chapter 20, 21. The nations will walk by the light of the Lord and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. It's talking about these things. Tyre changed. Tyre is no longer hoarding its money. It's giving its money. Tyre is no longer just giving. It's giving it to the Lord. And it's, and it's now being given to God's people. They're investing themselves in the church. Is what it's saying. That the nations are going to be, become part of God's people. And they're going to be not like they were, but like the Lord. And we're starting to see that. God is directing history to this new day. And that new day has begun in Christ's first coming. And it's, it's, it's beginning to happen as we see the nations come to Christ. That all are brought and all are one in Him. That He unites them together. It's like we saw last week with Egypt having that altar in the center of the, of the, of the country. It's, it's, it's strange term, ways of putting it. It's symbolic, isn't it? And it's, it's strange, but it's saying what the New Testament develops and brings out. God's plan is to the nations. And you and I are here today worshiping because of these promises. We're part of the Nair, the Tyre. Very few of us are of the people of Israel but we're part of the nations. And we've been brought to Him through Christ. And so we can rest in Him. We can trust in this sovereign Lord who's working out His plan throughout the world, throughout the, 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 the ages, throughout this present evil age, working out His plan to save a people for Himself. If you're His, you're part of that people. Rejoice this morning. And if you're not, become part of that people. Through Jesus Christ, trusting in Him, you can't save yourself. You'll never be able to save yourself. Don't ever think that you can stand on that last day and say, I did this, and I did that, and I was a good person. It won't cut it. You cannot, and I cannot save ourselves. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Don't be in the dark. Come into the light of Christ today. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you'd help us. Lord, you've given us much to think about. Lord, your word is strange at times to us. It communicates in ways we have a hard time getting. And yet it's there your sovereign hand throughout history, your sovereign hand to save a people from the nations. Oh Lord, be praised today. We praise you and glory in you. Hear our prayers and now meet us in the table. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.